I love the power glove. It's so bad. Well, that's one word for it. Video game accessories are awesome, providing you with an added level of immersion, giving you additional controls, and allowing you to experience a game in a way that isn't possible with the standard controller. And then sometimes there's, you know, this? Eh. Video game companies got real cute with their accessories. Some were blatant cash grabs, others ideas before their time, but the 10 items on this list were, honestly, they were just plain weird. We're gonna start with the Konami laser scope, which looks like what would happen if you asked ChatGPT to draw you a headphone set that would have been used in the early 90s. This accessory was first released in Japan in 1991, where it went by the name Gunsight. It was designed explicitly for the game Laser Invasion, but it also worked with any game that used the zapper gun, meaning that you could play Wild Gunmen or Duck Hunt with it. The headset was simple enough, albeit more than a little strange looking. In order to get it to work, you had to plug it into the audio jack of the Nintendo, meaning that it doubled as a headset. A scope over your right eye enabled you to target where you fired, and you would actually fire by yelling fire into the microphone. The problem. The tech was way, way too far ahead of its time, and users noted that the system fired frequently, even if there was just a little bit of background noise. To get the laser scope to work properly, you pretty much had to play in a quiet room, meaning if you had a younger sibling, you were screwed. You can get the laser scope on eBay for around $45, or $500 if it's still in the box. Happy shooting. Hey, have you ever wanted to play fighting games with a three-foot sword? Well, do I have good news for you? Meet the Hori Katana. This game was designed to work with the PS2 title Onimusha 3 Demon Siege, a 2004 hack and slash game. In conjunction with the game, Hori, a console manufacturer, designed this katana, a fully licensed accessory. As the name implies, the controller was one big ol' motion control sword. And I mean big, three feet big, meaning that you better have enough room to swing it or be prepared to break stuff. As you can see, the controller also had buttons, meaning you could exclusively use the katana when playing a game. Unfortunately for fans, the sword never really made it to America, with only a few thousand being sold worldwide. Buyers may have been freaked out by the $150 price, which, to be fair, is $250 now, and pretty expensive for an accessory that you could only use for one game. Fully boxed systems are available now on eBay, but be ready to pay out. The listings I found cost $750 if you still want a box set. Unboxed versions will cost around $130. Speaking of weird controllers that were meant for just one game, Anyone remember these? Meet the DK Bongos. All right, let's go back to the ancient times, 2004. Bush was president, and people across the world were obsessed with rhythm games like Dance Dance Revolution. Desperate to take advantage of this gaming trend, Nintendo pivoted to Donkey Konga. In the game, your job is to play the bongos along with the songs as you would any standard rhythm game. Because of their tie-in with the game, the bongos became a pretty popular accessory, maybe more popular than any other accessory on this very strange list. The game itself moved 1.18 million copies and was one of the 25 best-selling GameCube games, and while I couldn't find any specific information on the sales of the conga drums themselves, Themselves, it seems safe to say that they sold relatively well. Indeed, unlike the other accessories here, Donkey Konga actually spawned two sequels. I know a huge part of this list is meant to be goofy, but it seems worth noting that at least this game actually succeeded. Part of the reason for that? Nintendo leaned in. The Konga drums were a one-off accessory that were basically designed for one game, but Nintendo marketed the game as part of an already popular franchise and with an already popular gaming trend. There is no ahead of its time technology here, and the drums themselves work just fine. Furthermore, Nintendo supported the drums with robust marketing and other sales tactics that had always worked, including bundling the drums with the game. From the useful to the ridiculous, let's check out two of the stupidest accessories ever made. First, we have this ergonomic catastrophe, the Nintendo Switch Next Stand. Why, why not? Somehow, this accessory manages to take a device meant to be as portable as possible and mash together all of its inconveniences. Small size, reduced mobility, and a stiff neck. This Japanese accessory entitled itself as the, quote, comfortable hands-free stand, and I'm kind of impressed because it looks neither comfortable nor hands-free. As best I can tell, the device is meant to wrap around your neck and hold in position, allowing you to use the switch in an elevated manner, maybe while you're standing? Seriously, look at this thing. Even in the advertisement, the controller looks like it's getting in the way of the view of the actual switch. Funny thing is that there is obviously no shortage of actual Switch hands-free stands, some of which are actually useful and none of which require you to risk neck strain. So if you want a Switch stand, find something else, man. Speaking of ridiculous, for my fellow old heads out there, did you ever think to yourself, hey, I love my Atari, but I don't like the flexibility and freedom that comes with the joystick. What I really need is a big plank of wood. Well, then I have great news for you. 
Meet the Atari 2600 Stick Station. Yes, that's right. This accessory gives the kids what they always wanted. The ability to play the Atari with your controller firmly lodged in timber. Seriously, what the hell is this? As best I could tell, the stick station was manufactured in 1983, around the time of Atari's peak popularity. Incidentally, this was also around the time that countless low-quality shovelware games were being made. Games that would greatly contribute to the video game crash of the same year. Begging the question, what role did planks of wood play in the crash? As you can see, this big stick was manufactured in Louisville, Kentucky by the company Skyrider. It seemed to have been manufactured between 83 and 84 and disappeared shortly thereafter. It was 17 and a half inches long, six inches wide, and one and a half inches thick, making it ideal for holding a joystick or whacking a little brother in the head. At the time, it was sold for $14.95, which is actually $47.16 in today's money. Astonishing. You can get a block of wood for so much cheaper at Home Depot. Apparently, as the system was sold, the price also dropped, eventually hitting $9.95. The device was also available via mail order only. It came in walnut or poplar finish, and it was also available for the Wicco joystick, another popular joystick of the era. As you can see, this might be the most useless accessory on this list. However, believe it or not, it might not be the most awkward to use. That honor goes to this bad boy, the Resident Evil Chainsaw. At first glance, it looks like one of those special edition toys that is only sold in collector's edition of the game. However, upon closer examination, you'll note that the damn thing is actually a functional controller, specifically designed for use for Resident Evil 4. How does it work? Awkwardly! As noted by one review in Tech Radar, the buttons are not where you'd expect them to be, the shoulder buttons are not placed well, and the joysticks are small, making them difficult to use. Depending on the game you're playing, the strange layout can give you a very challenging experience, ranging between somewhat annoying and utterly unplayable. That's not to say that the chainsaw isn't just plain adorable. It's also relatively interesting. Only 50,000 were made in 2005 by manufacturer Nubitech. There are two different versions, and they came in different colors. Orange is for PS2, and yellow is for the GameCube. Each controller also comes with some unique features. If you have a PS2 version of the controller, you can use the pull start, just like you would a regular chainsaw, as an alternative start button. It's also possible that this feature was supposed to make a revving noise, which again, kind of amazing. If you have one of these controllers, you can also find a serial number on a silver plate on the side of each controller. Also, that blood splatter? That's unique. Each controller has a different splatter. So, do with that information what you will. Want one now? You can get them on eBay for a minimum of $300. From the creepy to the this. To the this. Meet the exciting boxing inflatable controller. What in hell? So, this thing was sold with exciting boxing, a 1987 title from Konami. As the name implies, this game was a very exciting boxing simulator. There seems to be some conflicting information on whether or not the inflatable controller was always sold with the game, but what is clear is how it works. You inflate this bad boy and then punch it during the game. Sensors in the boxer would then register in the game and show the results of the player's punches on the screen. As you would expect for a controller as deeply customized as this one, this inflatable friend only worked with exciting boxing, which is good because playing Super Mario Brothers with it would have been incredibly awkward. Exciting Boxing featured a training mode and a campaign mode. You fought from a first-person perspective and had to beat a series of increasingly difficult boxers training in between matches. There are a total of seven matches in the campaign, concluding with a title fight against Bob Spencer, who absolutely isn't supposed to look like Mr. T. The controller appears to have been sold as part of a larger package, which included a collector card, two sets of knit gloves, a foot pump to inflate our boxing friend, and our good buddy, the boxer himself. Want one of your own? Too bad. Seriously, I, I can't even find it on eBay. One website said the last one they had seen sold for $250. Speaking of ridiculous looking, there's this abomination. Meet the Segascope 3D glasses. No, those are not glasses that your grandmother wears when she's outside on a sunny day. The Segascope 3D glasses were invented by Mark Cerny, a game developer who programmed, among other games, Marble Madness. You can check out our video on that one in the description. According to Cerny, he saw the Michael Jackson short film Captain EO, which was in 3D. Inspired by the film, Cerny lobbied Sega to develop a 3D product, and the Segascope 3D glasses were born. As you can see, they plug directly into the system. However, this was 1987, which meant that they were never made for the Genesis. And astute observers may note that the box design clearly indicates that it is for the master system only. It worked through an internal shutter system that flashed rapidly, creating the illusion of 3D. It also only worked for eight games. 
Unfortunately, the accessory was not without real problems. The shutter blinking could make it seem as if the games were moving at half speed, thus giving games the appearance of flickering and damaging the frame rate. By the way, don't think that Sega had a monopoly on weird headwear. Meet the Sony Glastron, which is what all the cool kids had in 1996. You don't remember that? No. Hmm. As you can see, the Glastron was a head-mounted display that smashed screens up into your eyes. Its features, which included two LCD screens and earphones, allowed for a deeper sense of immersion in games that were available at the time. Some games could be directly configured for use with the Glastron. For example, MechWarrior 2, personal favorite of mine, allowed players to see the cockpit of their mechs from a first-person perspective. The system actually seems like a precursor to VR systems. There would ultimately be five versions of the Glastron, all of which came out between 1996 and 1998. Later versions had additional features, including shutters that allowed you to see through the screens when you needed, better screens, and more. Also, they were not cheap, costing $500 in 1996 money, meaning that they would be $1,000 today. Yikes. Also, I mean, really, how good could these be for your eyes? There were repeated safety warnings in the instruction manual, and the system would actually shut off after six hours as a safety feature. If you are using a device that turns off to stop you from using it, maybe this device wasn't the greatest idea to begin with. And finally, we close with the Game Boy Pocket Sonar. So fishing accessories are everywhere. Seriously, there's quite a few versions for quite a few different fishing games. What makes the pocket sonar so different is you can actually catch fish with it. This 1998 accessory was developed by Bandai. The game would plug into the slot just like any other Game Boy game. What made it different was that the sonar tool was attached at the end of the wire. The display would then show you nearby fish. According to a few reviews, it was actually kind of good. It came with numerous functionalities, including the ability to set custom icons, zoom in, zoom out, change views, and focus on specific areas. Again, we're talking 1998, that's not bad. And if this wasn't enough for you, the sonar also came with a fishing game and a fishing encyclopedia. It almost sounds like a real world version of Pokemon. Gotta catch them all. Sadly, the Game Boy Pocket Sonar was only released in Japan, meaning those of us in America and Europe never got the joy of sticking an expensive electronics device way, way too close to a body of water. You know what, look, seriously, anybody can make money off of some of these accessories. I'm gonna go invent my own. We'll call it the Almost Something Controller. It will work. Almost. Yeah, sorry, I'm done. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, like and subscribe. It really does make a difference. As always, thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day, and we should see you next week. Be well, folks.